Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm Susan Stinson. I'm the writer in residence at Forbes, and this is the local history, local novelist series. Um, and there's one more um, event in the series on May 1st. That's a celebration of local novelists with Suzanne Strimpik Shea, Marianne Banks, Michelle Barker, and Karen Williams, who's written a novel about Mary Bliss Parson, who was accused of being a witch in the um, 17th century Northampton. Um, we, the, the following month, there's going to be a reading of writers from the writing room who use the, our um, bi weekly writing room here at Forbes, which should be lovely. And then the Local History, Local Novelist series will be back in October. Um, and the first event in the series in October is a book launch for my book, Spider in a Tree, which is about Northampton in the time of Jonathan Edwards. Tonight, well, the project of the series is to put the work of historians, novelists, and poets in conversation with each other um, often using very different voices. So tonight we have a, a historian and two poets who also write many other things. Um, and exploring themes rising from Jewish thought and, um, and how Jewish thought has shifted discourses, other discourses, created culture, and also from the experiences of Jewish people living lives in 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century New England. So it's, I'm really excited about um, this event. I think it's going to be fascinating. Uh, so we're starting, and, and I'm, I just want to be sure that I don't forget to say that all of the um, writers have brought books that are, they'll be happy to sign and, and sell to you after the reading. They're on the table over there. So please take a look. Um, at the end of the reading. So, the first speaker. Michael Hoberman teaches American literature at Fitchburg State University. He's the author of three books on New England history and culture, including, most recently, New Israel, New England, Jews and Puritans in Early America. In 2010, he was Fulbright Senior Scholar of American Studies in the Netherlands. And he is currently co-editing a book on early Jewish American history due out in 2014. His previous books are How Strange It Seems, Cultural Life of Jews in Small Town New England, and Yankee Moderns, Folk Regional Identity in the Sawmill Valley of Western Massachusetts, 1890 to 1920. We are delighted to have, he lives in Shelburne Falls, and we are very happy and lucky to have him tonight. Well, first of all, if you thought you were getting a historian, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm an English professor who pretends to be a historian. I, tr I, I do a somewhat adequate job of pretending to be an English professor, for that matter, when I actually study and write about history. So anyway, um, I want to get right to the point here uh, and talk about the convergence of Jewish culture and New England culture, that's been uh, the subject that I've been studying for the last six or seven years. Uh, I meandered to it from other interests. Uh, and it starts with a, a, just a little, a story about stories. Um, when I was writing my previous book, uh, How Strange It Seems, which was an oral history of small town Jewish life, uh, not just in Massachusetts, but also in New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, and Maine. I, I encountered two versions of more or less the same story. Uh, one from uh, an informant that I met somewhere, I think in Laconia, New Hampshire, and the other, uh, somebody I interviewed, I think it was in Berkshire County. Uh, and the story was more or less uh, this one. Uh, a lot of the, the contents of that book talked about the uh, traveling peddlers, the Jewish peddlers who came, first came to rural New England mid uh, to late 19th century. And the story would be relayed, in both cases it was relayed by somebody like the grandson or the granddaughter or great-granddaughter of this original peddler who first came to Great Barrington in 1892 or whatever. Uh, and the story was that, well, my great-grandfather was traveling through this tiny little New England village and he was invited into the house, the farmhouse, uh, and sat down by the fire 
you know, there was, in other words, they, these people were nice to him. Uh, they, they were uh, excited to have a traveling peddler stop by their house. Uh, and one thing that they demanded of him was that they, they wanted him to read uh, some Hebrew from his siddur, from his prayer book. These New England Yankee farmers were fascinated by the Hebrew language, by the history of the Jews, by the idea of an actual Jew, an actual, uh, an actual descendant of the people of Israel. So that story, uh, you know, the fact that I encountered two versions of it, first of all, I don't know if it's true, that doesn't really matter, but the fact that I could find uh, versions of it in two different places suggested to me, uh, or just sort of confirmed for me a, a, a hunch that I had, that there is some strange uh, thematic convergence between the culture of the Jews uh, and the culture of New England. Uh, and that's really what's absorbed a lot of my research and attention over the last few years is trying to figure what that connection is. Uh, and I, I've been more or less disappointed uh, in this quest because I found all kinds of interesting things out, but in terms of explaining what that convergence is or accounting for it, uh, my answers are not particularly, at least to me, not particularly satisfying, but I'll, I'll relay them to you anyway. First, I'll tell you about the two books that I wrote uh, and tell you what I did find out. I mean, the things I found out were interesting and the books were worth writing and maybe some of you might find them to be worth reading. Um, in reverse order, because New England, New Israel, which tells the story of Puritans and Jews uh, in 17th and 18th century New England, that's the book I wrote more recently, but it's basically the prequel to the book that I started with that I just was telling you about. So uh, in New Israel, New England, uh, I did archival research at several different places, including the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, and uh, the American Jewish Historical Society in, in, in uh, New York City. Uh, and what I wanted to find out was a more about the, uh, within Puritan New England, what was the nature of the Puritans' fascination with the Jews? Uh, we know that Puritans were often comparing themselves to the children of Israel and talking about their trip across the Atlantic as an exodus to the new Canaan and so on. But what did that actually mean? And more particularly, and this is something that uh, cultural historians really hadn't looked at yet, um, what, were, what would happen when you looked at that sort of abstract interest that Puritans had for the biblical Jews? Uh, what would happen when you sort of juxtapose that with the reality of actual Jewish people who actually lived in the Atlantic world and uh, were settling in large numbers in places like London and Amsterdam? These are places that Puritans passed through as well. So. Uh, in that book, I try to investigate several episodes of interaction, whether uh, literal, physical interaction or, or just discursive interaction through the sharing of letters and, and uh, people writing about each other, what Puritans wrote about Jews, uh, what happened when they met actual Jews, how did their interactions with actual Jews inform or shift or, or confirm for them ideas that they had about Judaism uh, and about the people of Israel. And as I say, there's some disappointment here. Not, well, disappointment isn't, isn't the right word, but basically what that book ends up talking about, mostly, I tell some, I think, interesting stories. Uh, I'll mention some of the, the, the famous people that I write about, but essentially what that book ends up doing is talking about how when Puritans wrote about Jews, when they uh, expressed their fascination with Jews, they were basically airing out their own dilemmas. There are all kinds of ways in which Puritanism itself uh, is, a, is a conflicted, I don't even want to call it a faith, it's a, it's a range of different uh, Protestant uh, belief systems. Uh, and Puritans were always at odds with each other about the proper ways to manage the church, the proper ways to uh, recognize uh, that God's grace is more important than any idea of the things you do in life. Puritans were eternally conflicted and their investigations of Jewish history equipped them sometimes to uh, air these debates among each other. So they, needless to say, when they talked about Jews, they rarely agreed with each other. Uh, an, an obvious case in point uh, that you might have some familiarity with is the story of Roger Williams, who was banished from Massachusetts early on, sent to Rhode Island, uh, well, the reason he was sent to Rhode Island, you could say, among other things, that his interpretation of the Hebrew Bible differed 
from the interpretation of the Hebrew Bible that you might have gotten from somebody like John Winthrop. Uh, they interpreted the legacy of the Jews diff in different ways, uh, and this manifested itself uh, in, through various episodes. Uh, in, in that story of the 17th and 18th century. Now, some of the famous people that you might or might not have known about as having some connection to Judaism, uh, Cotton Mather, uh, who uh, perhaps um, it escaped your attention that Cotton Mather, when he went to Harvard and uh, earned his master's degree, his master's thesis was on the Hebrew vowel points. Cotton Mather was probably, the, I think it's safe to say, he was the greatest scholar of the Hebrew language on, in the Western Hemisphere in his time. Uh, and even when occasionally uh, people with greater, seemingly greater Jewish, you know, Jewish-born people uh, came to New England, their Hebrew skills couldn't match up to Cotton Mather's Hebrew skills. Uh, he's one person. Samuel Sewell is another person who comes into this story. Uh, he was the magistrate, a great uh, important magistrate in Massachusetts who wrote about Jews uh, at different times. Uh, some of these people produced conversion pamphlets. They wanted to convert Jews to Christianity. And it's, you know, it's, uh, this is something we're familiar with, a pattern we're familiar with. Um, and uh, Sewell was one of these people. Uh, he interacted with Jews in London and wrote about it uh, later on in his life. Uh, other people who come to mind, here's another person that you probably haven't heard of. The first uh, professor of Hebrew at Harvard was born Jewish, and this person's name was Judah Monis. Uh, he uh, taught at Harvard from 1722 to uh, 1760 when he retired. Um, he arrived in uh, North America in, uh, I think, 1716, came to New York City, had studied at the yeshiva in uh, Amsterdam, uh, moved to New York, joined the Jewish community there, decided that there was no chance. I mean, the Jews in New York, there were more of them there than in New England, but these people just really, they couldn't afford a rabbi. Uh, they probably didn't quite know what a rabbi was. They were not particularly observant, and Monis realized that the only way that he could really be a rabbi was by converting to Christianity and teaching Hebrew at Harvard, and that's what he did. Um, so that's one of the stories uh, that comes into this book. Um, uh, okay, so just to, to sum up some of the important points about uh, the conclusions that I reached, what kinds of, what factors uh, were in the Jews' favor uh, during the colonial era? Why is, it, why is it the case that Jews actually, why did they decide to come to North America and not just New, uh, less so New England uh, than the other uh, places like New York, uh, Savannah, Georgia? Why did they come here in the first place? A few reasons. One, uh, they were, quote, unquote, I'm using air quotes around the word welcomed. Some historians have said the Jews were welcomed. I don't think that that's quite the right word. Uh, but they were accepted uh, partially. Most important reason, they weren't Catholics. Okay, there's, there's nothing in British North America, there was nothing worse than being tainted with any stain of Catholicism. And not only were these Sephardim, these are Sephardim, not only are they not Catholics, but they're actually the victims of the Inquisition that was perpetrated by Catholics. Uh, and Protestants, including Cotton Mather, loved to beat up on the Spanish for inflicting the Inquisition on the Jews. Uh, not that he, uh, you know, these, the Puritans knew the Jews were going to hell. But all the same, uh, they appreciated the fact that they weren't Catholics. Uh, also, the, the, other, the other thing that figured into this story is that uh, these Jews were transatlantic merchants. Uh, and Puritans, as you know well, they founded uh, Massachusetts. They created the city of Boston. They were very industrious, productive, capitalistic people uh, in the early modern era. And you really couldn't conduct transatlantic business without getting involved, at least with the Sephardim, who again, they're in Amsterdam, they're in London, they're in the West Indies, they're all over the place. Um, another reason, uh, maybe a, a, a less one that takes a little further explanation: Why was uh, why were Jews able eventually to establish themselves in colonial America? Has to do with the fact that uh, English Protestants of various sorts throughout British North America hated each other. You know, the, the, the Baptists didn't like the Congregationalists and so on and so forth. So there was so much infighting among various Protestant sects that eventually a decision was, you know, a, a de facto decision was reached. Well, we don't want any one church to gain the upper hand. 
Uh, worst of all would be if the Anglican Church uh, took, took control. So the only way to keep that from happening is to create a rhetoric that basically presents something along the lines of what we call religious tolerance. And that's where Roger Williams was coming from among other people. So in order to prevent one Protestant sect from gaining uh, reign over the rest, uh, British North Americans, uh, in, particularly in the 18th century, moved in the direction of uh, inventing a religious tolerance, and that's how the, and so the door was open and the Jews came in. Okay, now, this brings me just very quickly, I wanna talk about the second uh, part of this whole story. Uh, and this was the, the part of the story I began with, which was the oral history of Jews in small town New England many years later, right? Because the Jews I've been talking about so far are these mostly Portuguese and Spanish uh, descendants, Sephardim. Jewish immigration to North America sort of dies out uh, around the time of the Revolutionary War. Then there's an upsurge of Jews coming here in the mid-19th century, mostly refugees from Germany, from all of the political tumult in Germany. But it really isn't until the late 19th century that uh, the people that are, I think I've heard something, some statistic like 90% of American Jews are descended from people who came here from Eastern Europe between the years 1886 uh, and 1922. Okay, so when those people start to come, that's when you start to see Jewish communities and synagogues and so on in Great Barrington, in Laconia, in Burlington, Vermont, in Springfield, Massachusetts. What's that story about? Now again, the, the quest was to uncover some mystical connection between the Jews and, the, and, and uh, in this case, New England Yankees, the, the descendants of the Puritans. The reality that I found uh, after I conducted these interviews, uh, maybe a little disappointing on that score, was basically that if you focused as I did on folk culture, on vernacular culture, on food ways, on uh, just sort of people's ordinary lives, the way they led their Jewish lives, the kind of work they did, these Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. Basically what you find out is that Jews in small towns in New England had more in common with Jews in small town Missouri, or Jews in small town Oregon, or Jews in small town Wisconsin than they did with other small town New Englanders. Okay, in other words, somehow or other, for various demographic cultural reasons, uh, and other regionalist historians have written about this, uh, for, particularly about Jews in the South, that you can try to make the case that Southern Jews are some, you know, there's the, the, the shalom y'all kind, you could try to make the case, you could try to make the case that there is a sort of Southern Jewish folk culture, but it just doesn't hold up before the reality that Jews, wherever they are in the United States or Canada for that matter, have more in common with each other in other regions than they do in those regions. And it has to do with all kinds of things, including uh, you know the, st the dominant story, the narrative in these small towns uh, in this region was that by the post-World War II period, after two or three generations of small town Jews in one town operating, you know, clothing stores and prospering quite nicely, what would happen is the second or third or fourth generation would decide to go off to college somewhere uh, and join a profession. And why would you want to go back to uh, Laconia if, uh, if Philadelphia called you? Uh, or, or Los Angeles or someplace like that. So that's what I found there. Now, I don't want to leave on, on, a, on a complete note of disappointment here, but there are some, thank you, there are some uh, convergences that uh, at least tentatively I could speak to. One, uh, which came to me when I was working on the oral history book was that there's something that small town New England uh, and New England as a region has in common with Jewish culture, at least in the United States, and that seems to be that there's a tension within the regional culture of New England and a tension among American Jews between attachment to tradition, reverence for things that have come before, for the old, the ancient ways, uh, and so on. There's a tension between that and a sense of innovation. I mean, the Jews in some ways I think of as the most modern people in world history because of their mobility, because of their transnationality, their multilinguality, and so on. So the Jews, wherever you find them, tend to be 
uh, sort of caught between the old and the new, and there are ways in which New England itself is a region within the United States where the same pattern, I think, holds true, where people cling to tradition uh, and, the, you know, the, the, whatever it might be, the, the town meeting, things like that, and at the same time, this, to the extent that this region has done well for itself, it's done well because it's a forward future looking uh, culture. Again, that's a tenuous, a tentative, a tentative connection. One more point that I would make. Uh, and maybe you've been wondering, well, what, isn't there some connection that you could draw between, uh, you know, the Protestant work ethic and the Jewish achievement drive, you know, all these wasps who got rich and all these Jews who worked themselves to death to, to achieve some, some, I think there is, so, okay, so basically what we're saying here is that there's anxiety, uh, <laughs> is, a shared, is a shared quality. The roots of that anxiety are divergent. The reason the Jews are anxious, if they're anxious, is a discrete reason from the reason uh, that I suppose that uh, New England Yankees are anxious. But the anxiety, all the same, creates a culture of self-reflexiveness, of uh, people who are constantly measuring themselves up against a certain standard uh, and always typically disappointed uh, with uh, their uh, failure to achieve that standard. Uh, and then finally, and here we are in a library, maybe that also translates into a shared tradition among the Jews and among New England people, at least in places like the Forbes Library, a value for books and disputation and debate and argumentation uh, and the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of wonders that we find between the covers of books. Uh, you know, the people of the book uh, is a term always often used in association with the Jews, and I guess you could, if you had to identify a cultural group in the United States on a regional basis that is also a kind of people of the book, well, I would nominate New Englanders as the, those people of the book. This is the most heavily self-reflective, self-documenting culture in the United States, uh, and you can see it in these bookshelves around you, which are all local history. You can see it in the archives I've studied in in Boston. Uh, people have pointed out the Yankees, the New England Yankees is the most studied ethnic group uh, in the history of the world. Uh, somebody said something to that effect. I think there's, you know, anecdotally anyway, it sounds like it's probably, it's probably a grain of truth to it. So I think I'm out of time, but I know there'll be time for discussion afterwards, and I look forward to hearing from the other two speakers as well. Thanks. I'm so excited. That was so good. Rich Michelson is the author of more than 20 books for adults and children. He has been a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award and the National Jewish Book Award twice. He received a Sidney Taylor Gold and Silver Medal from the Association of Jewish Librarians, the only author to be honored with their two top awards in the organization's history. The New York Times, Publishers Weekly, and The New Yorker have all listed Michelson's book among their 10 best of the year. Michelson's adult poetry have been published in many anthologies. Um, the Jerusalem Post called his latest collection, Battles and Lullabies, a touching masterpiece and one of the best poetry books in many years. He's the owner of our Michelson's galleries and the current poet laureate of Northampton, Massachusetts. Richard Wilbur has written that Michelson's poetry asks with urgent eloquence how the sweetness of life can be sheltered from the terrors of our time and what art can make of such a world as ours. His poems are artful, humane, and true. And I experience all of that when I read Battles and Lullabies, which I've done multiple times. And I also experience an intense and as if inevitable compression of time that jolts the present, especially the present within a family, um, for instance, fathers and sons, daughters and grandmothers, with the insistence of the past, with all of its commerce, violence, and love. To get all that on tape because I'm not reading. Um, I think that's pretty good. Um, Jewish writers' history in New England. Well, I'm Jewish and I'm a writer, so that works. Uh, I have to admit that 
I still, as someone who grew up without any Jewish education of any kind, I was never bar mitzvahed, I never attended a Hebrew school, it's still always odd for me that um, I end up mostly speaking now in synagogues and uh, various uh, day schools. Uh, you know, when uh, Susan mentioned the Sidney Taylor gold medal, when they actually called me to tell me, uh, I'd won a couple of years back, uh, they called on Christmas Eve. They actually called on Christmas Eve. And I expected, of course, not hearing from anybody, and I didn't make a connection with the name, so uh, when um, the woman called and said, you know, I'm from the AJL, could I speak to Rich Michelson? And I said, well, you've got me, but it's really not a good time. I'm busy wrapping Christmas presents. <laughs> and um, can I call you back in a couple of days? And uh, I was like in the middle of the night when the name hit me, and I said, Oh shit, man, I blew this big time. Um, they're gonna take this award away, but they didn't. Um, I'm gonna start out with a poem called Elijah versus Santa. <laughs> Weight advantage, Santa. Sugar and milk at every stop. The stout man shimmies down one more chimney. Sack of desire shooting behind. While Elijah, skinny and empty-handed, slips in invisible as a once-favored, since-disgraced uncle through the propped open side door. Inside, I've been awaiting a miracle since 1962, my nine-year-old self slouching on the slip-covered sofa, Manischewitz stashed beneath the cushion. Where are the fire-tinged horses, the chariots, to transport me? Where is the whirlwind and brimstone? Instead, our dull-bladed sleigh rusts in the storage bin beneath the building's soot-covered flight of cellar stairs. Come back to me, Father, during December's perfect snowfall, and pull me once more up Skank and down Pitkin where the line wraps around Church Hall. Show me again the snapshot of the skullcap boy on Santa's lap. Let me laugh this time and levitate like a magician's assistant, awed by my own weightlessness. Give me the imagination to climb the fire escape and look up toward the godless heavens and to marvel at the ordinary sky. That's brand new, I'm still getting used to it. Um, I grew up in uh, East New York, Brooklyn, at a time when Brooklyn was a place you worked like hell to get out of. Now you can work every day and not be able to afford to get back in. Um, but my dad had a small hardware store um, that had grown up from a little hardware push cart that his dad had. And my job as a kid, it was a neighborhood that was 95% um, Jewish when I was born. Um, by the time we got out, we were the last Jewish family. And there was a lot of racial tension. My job as a child was to um, bang, the, bang up the trash cans that my dad sold um, before he put them out for sale because otherwise they'd look new and would be stolen. And um, I wrote this poem when I was about a garbage strike at the time. Uh, even as a young man, it did not escape my attention that our garbage cans were getting stolen, but the garbage was not getting picked up. Uh, my father had this brilliant idea, and this poem is called Gift Wrapping the Garbage. My father's gift wrapping the garbage. Be you full, he says. Four bundles, and his accent, Brooklyn, wraps like a bow around each. Eight days into the strike, and the world smells like soup. Kreplach soup, he says. Your Aunt Ida's know what I mean. <laughs> My son can't picture it. The neighborhood, its poverty, 
and I've lost the point trying to explain myself. Poor, I'm yelling, poor, and suddenly my eyes are popping like danger fields on Letterman until my son takes pity. Okay, he asks, how poor? <laughs> Laugh, my father says, if you want to, but don't they all love Christmas? His accent is on the they, but weren't times different then? It was a Jewish neighborhood, and then it was a Negro neighborhood until the Puerto Ricans drove out the blacks. Schwarzes, I used to say, and Schwartzes would echo back. Stop talking garbage, my mother says, but aren't I my father's son? Every problem he taught me has a solution, and I've got to tell you, they stole our garbage lickety-split. <laughs> We danced together, clapping like two comics in a Catskill routine, me squealing with my Kvidradika voice, high and squeaky, as I held on to him, held on to him tight. How tight, my son asks. <laughs> but just now, I'm not in the mood for his sarcasm. I'd rather weep. I'd rather watch this old newsreel, my father working himself to death I mean literally and dying out on the street, one more dead Jew. Take out the damn garbage, I tell my son. Sure, I'd rather hug him, but right now, isn't my heart on the roller coaster at Coney Island? And I'm barely holding on. I really um, became aware of my Jewish heritage and started embracing it a bit uh, after I met and married a very re religious Methodist um, who's crouching in her seat back there right now. <laughs> Hi, Jen. <laughs> and um, when, uh, when I met her family, I was uh, her grandparents, Jennifer's grandparents. I was the, literally the first Jew they ever met. And, um, and when we first went up to, I mean, we're talking about farmers, vigorous, healthy people. And they lived on the Canadian border. And I used to dread the trip up there, but her grandfather was 80 when we went to uh, his birthday party. And, um, you know, that was our first trip, and talk about feeling like Woody Allen and Annie Hall. Um, I really felt Jewish. Uh, they were great with motors, electricity, all that stuff. This poem is called Life Insurance. How about that electricity, my wife's grandfather says. He's bounding his 80 years down the stairs to help me uncurl my prematurely shuttled back out of this once luxurious VW wagon that somehow downsized itself, compacting throughout our aching eight-hour drive through the storm. Ain't it something, he says, the way swoosh comes back on, lighting up all the houses like candles on a village-sized birthday cake. I'm already disarmed. The unaffected wisdom, the unprejudiced enthusiasm, He's never met, my wife says, a real Jew before. And I, resisting the urge to ask about imposters, watch him walk seven times around this wedding chupa of a wagon, kicking each tire, questioning my engine's horsepower. I'm thinking as he moves about the wonder of the small engine that drives his body. And I'm judging my own grandfathers for refusing to live long enough for me to be born. It's not only a history of heart failure and colon cancer, but history itself, the imperturbable iron horse, the houses burning down like candles. Amazing, my wife's grandfather says. He's bent over the fan belt, testing its elasticity while I, charmed and disoriented, twirl imaginary side locks before setting off like a dachshund at his heels. 
All that was 20 years ago. And ever since, my lower lumbar's been arguing this entire two-day drive, <laughs> eight hours up and back the next, each year his probable last, while our new Teutonic tank-sized SUV protected one child and then our next. What if just once we don't go, I beg my wife, but she's already loading the valises, looking like one of those smooth-skinned milkmaidens grown up on the fresh air of her grandfather's farm. Maybe it is only centuries of suffering and Jewish guilt that keeps the world alive, I say, sounding as if my living depended on selling life insurance to centenarians. I'm comfortable now, stretched out in the back, heels up on our luggage, imagining myself as a grandfather, while up front my youngest swerves in the driver's seat, the roads clogged with hundredth birthday revelers converging like electrons on the nucleus of a one-horse town. My hope for my own children is not that they live forever, but try explaining that to a teenager at the wheel of a car. How much life insurance do you have? My son asked me once. <laughs> he was eight at the time, already counting out an inheritance, calculating his share of the world. Watch the road, I yell, angry for no reason after all these years, except that I'm growing tired and suddenly scared. It's almost sundown. And I still don't understand how the electricity travels from one lamppost to the next, lighting up the future as if it's daybreak on the horizon and we have all the time in the world. dead Negro. I'm heading back to Brooklyn. Nothing is where I left it. The empty littered lot next to my father's hardware store has turned up two blocks to the north. Even the store itself, which sold its last hammer and nail to the contractor who tore it down, putting this substandard duplex in its place, is missing and the neighbor's children are now the neighbors, and the chalk outline of my father is rained from the gutter where he settled down with the bullet that killed him. Somewhere else, the murderer is murdering somebody else. But everything is the same in this poem where the poet misplaces his keys. My old Jewish neighborhood is filled with blacks, and the African-American neighborhoods are busy with Asians, and the Mexicans are everywhere. But here, in this dark bistro, in this Soviet-era city of Skov, six hours south of St. Petersburg, there is a dead Negro on the bar menu. The dead Jews, my father among them, rise up in protest like the benevolent protectors they once were. They are looking for the picket line, which is no longer where they left it. And the leftists have moved to the right, and God is looking for God everywhere. Nothing is where I left it. Not my hammer and sickle, not my star of David, not my well-thumbed book of poems. My wife and children are nowhere to be found. Oh, Amachai, can you help me to find my keys in the pockets of the Palestinian boy moved into my Brooklyn home? His sister is missing, and his mother is not where he left her. It's enough to start anyone drinking. I'll have a dead Negro, somebody says, from the next booth. A black man, maybe the one who killed my father. But in this light, I can't tell everyone looking exactly the same. I'm going to end, I think that's my time, with one last poem. This is called Undressing and Freedom. I 
undressing Aunt Frida, I think of how, undressing me, she would tilt back her head as if listening for footsteps, the faint marching of the SS men whose one great dream was her death. They must have feared how her young Jewish fingers unbuttoned and buttoned, as if they had continents to cross, as if here in East New York I was already tiring and no one at home to put me to bed. Undressing Aunt Frieda, I tried to imagine her healthy, undressing herself, slowly at first, as if for the love of a man, untying her green checkered apron with the secret pockets, unwrapping the frail, just shy of five-foot body, whose scarred beauty Rubens would surely have missed, but Rembrandt, in the loneliness of his dying days, might have immortalized. My daughter at my side grows restless. She unties her shoes, tugs at each sock, she has learned recently to undress herself, and pausing occasionally for applause, does so now. Naked, she shimmies up onto the bed, curls her thin fingers around Frida, who, as if she wished herself already dead, doesn't coo or even smile. A dream of love, Frida preached, is not love but a dream. And bad luck, I'd say, follows the bitter heart. But undressing her now, I remember the lightness of her hands and their strength, which somehow lifted me above the nightmares she had known. I'll care for you, she whispered once, as if you were my own. My daughter yawns. I lift her gently, hoping she'll sleep the hour drive home. Thank you very much. Often called the Hans Christian Andersen of America, is the author of over 300 books, including Owl Moon, The Devil's Arithmetic, and How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight. The books range from rhymed picture books and baby board books through middle grade fiction, poetry collections, nonfiction, and up to novels and story collections for young adults and adults, and also adult poetry. Her books and stories have won an assortment of, award, of awards. Two Nebulas, a World Fantasy Award, a Caldecott, the Golden Kite Award, three Mythopoetic Awards, two Christopher Medals, a nomination for the National Book Award, and the Jewish Book Award, among <coughs> others. She is also the winner for a body of work of the Curlin Award, the World Fantasy Asso Association Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Catholic Library's Regina Medal. She attended Smith College and got a master's in education from UMass. Six colleges and universities have given her honorary doctorates. She now lives in Hatfield. And Jane is reading tonight, I think, from Ekaterinoslav, One Family's Passage to America, a memoir in verse. In poetry and with kind of amazing family photographs, she explores and reconstructs a passage her father never spoke of, the journey of his family from the Ukraine to New Haven. And Jane does hear what she describes in the introduction as what poetry does best, turning the dry rota of history into something beautiful and true. Jane I love listening to both of you. Um, it was phenomenal. And I was taking notes and trying to think how much I could steal. Um, and I was also stunned by how much Rich and I have a very similar background. 
I had already planned to tell you this little story at the beginning and see how it sort of synchronizes with what he said. I also came from a very not terribly uh, Jewish, Jewish background. Um, and at one point, I had written a book called Hark, uh, A Christmas Treasury. <laughs> and I was reading it at a bookstore, and a little boy raised his hand at the end, and he said, but I thought you were Jewish. How could you write a book about Christmas? And I looked at him, and I said, I've written murder mysteries, too. <laughs> And his mother fell off the chair laughing. <laughs> and the kid is going, what, 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 what does she mean? So, um, also, I married a fallen away Catholic. Um, he said, I, I didn't fall away. He said, I climbed away. Um, but this year is my Jewish year. Because I not only have Ekaterina Slav out, but I thought I'd show you this too. These are my bona fides. Um, many of you, I think, do know the devil's arithmetic. Um, and that's old, but I have this year, bug came out. That stands for big ugly guy. The big ugly guy is a golem. Um, young Jewish kid in the Midwest uh, is um, being bullied. Uh, and he builds a, go a golem. And the golem becomes the drummer in his uh, klezmer fusion band, um, because that's what golems do. They bang on things. Uh, the problem always, of course, with something like a golem is how do you get rid of them? Because the bullies are, are beaten back, but who's the bully now? Um, and then I have a cookbook a literary cookbook. So I did this with my daughter, who actually can cook. Um, and it's called Jewish Fairy Tale Feasts. So you see, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, this is my, and now I'm working on a book with Barbara Diamond Golden, which we are now calling Girl's Bible, but it'll probably be called something else at some point. Um, so I'm going to mostly read from Ekaterina Slav, but I wanted to read a broadside um, I brought some of them with me um, as well. It's called Jerusalem, Another Side. And it starts with an epigram um, by uh, Naomi Shehab Nye from a poem of hers in which she says, uh, it's a poem about Jerusalem, and it ends, it's late, but everything comes next. This is the poem. That clock stands at five to midnight or if you shift your head slightly, five to noon, your choice. These things are always a choice. We do not have to build more barriers. They will unbuild themselves in time. The world is like that if we let it unsew, unknit, loosen the bonds. I like to think of us walking backwards, finding a vineyard, sitting on the ground, eating dates, drinking the sweet water gushing from the desert, making flowers grow. I do not throw stones. You shall not eat them. Shalom Aleichem, I say softly to you. You respond, Aleichem Shalom. It is the start of everything. Now, as Susan said, my, my father's people came from the Ukraine. But until I was 35, ooh, that's interesting. Um, until I was 35, I thought my father had been born in New Haven, or maybe Waterbury. It seemed to change and move. Um, but I had grown up all my life with, and then he gave me this photograph of himself as a child. Now, if you look closely at it, he's wearing a, a, a fur hat and a fur coat at four years old. And anyone I show this to says, and I say, where's this child from? And they all say, the Russias. I said, no, he's from New Haven. <laughs> so my father, by commission or omission, lied to me. Um, he lied about a lot of things. but. For me, somehow the biggest was where he had been born. 
Um, so when I went to write a memoir, and I tried writing it as a memoir, I realized I knew nothing. All of his older brothers and sisters had already died or were, were in the last stages of dementia. Only he and his younger brother, um, by the time I was ready to do this, uh, were alive. And my father, as far as he was concerned, had, had, had been born at age 16 when he left home. And he just didn't want to talk about where he'd come from. So in the family tradition, I made it up. I did talk to a number of my cousins. I have 75 cousins, um, if you're counting my oldest, who's 99, and the youngest, who's a baby. Everybody has different stories. Even when they're supposedly the same stories, they're different. So there's no one from the old family to actually find out how true these stories are. So one of the problems with writing strict, a strict uh, memoir is you really ought to get some, some information. You really ought to write, to write what's actual. But the town that they lived in, the shtetl that they lived in in the Ukraine, Ekaterinoslav, doesn't exist anymore. And the family joke has always been that if the Cossacks hadn't killed them and they stayed, Hitler would have killed them. And if Hitler hadn't gotten to them and they stayed, Chernobyl would have gotten them. So, you know, that's the perfect trifecta. Uh, but they came over, and this goes back to what Michael said, they came over in between 1910 and 1914 in waves, three waves. First the oldest son, then the three oldest daughters um, who became milliners uh, in, uh, in New York and New Haven, and then, then the, um, the rest of the family. There were eight children, and eight living children in all. So I'm going to read you a few of the poems, uh, and I'm going to start with the first poem, which is called Picture This. Picture this small shtetl, packed dirt streets, rutted with market day traffic. In the town center, Jews sell eggs, cheese, chickens, milk. In front of the butcher shop, close by the blacksmiths, my grandfather sets up a stall. His bottles of kerosene, like good soldiers, upright, polished, shining, stand in five straight lines. A river of Gentiles flows in, almost drowning the shtetl's population, moving sluggishly amongst the Jews. The sound of Ukrainian, Yiddish, Russian rattles around the stalls. The speakers talk about weather and whether the rains will catch them out. Ah, uh, a gesund auf dein Kopf. Good health on your head. They argue about the price of flour, vodka, grain for the cows, but never about the czar. That's a topic for the hidden places. Hedgerows, houses, shoe. A fire soll him treffen. He should burn up. Some things are best never said aloud. For a while, Gentile and Jew sound like intimates, but no one is really fooled. Religion, history, language, custom, like the walls of a medieval city, keep them divided, their prejudices holding them for now, for this moment, alive and apart. Some of the stories I heard about my grandmother, who I always knew as this, well, I only knew her until she was, till I was three, and then she died. But I always knew from the stories, she was this sort of, and, and the photographs, round, small, round um, lady who still spoke a lot of Yiddish. Um, and and uh, that's all I knew about her. And then I started hearing the stories about her as a young woman. and. This poem is made up of all the stories that I heard. Now, are they all true? They were told to me by Yolans. I have no idea if they're true, but I love them all. It's called Spinster. At 17, orphan, half-orphaned, outspoken, literate and numerate, keeper of her father's books, 
she could pass as a Ukrainian peasant driving horse and cart ahead of the Cossacks to rescue Jews and hide them in cellars. She was considered unmarriageable by the aunts. They honked about her single state, called her father selfish, brought in a shodkin, a matchmaker, to find her a suitable mate. But like a peasant's mule, she balked at any arrangement they tried to make, till she heard about a young man who spoke many languages more than Yiddish, visiting his brother and helping with his work. Without permission, she dressed in black, veiled, disguised, accompanied by the maid, went off to the store to get a look like some princess out of a tale, came home and made the match herself. Scandalized, the ants shook their fingers at her, but her papa knew she would be happy and make many babies, and the girls would all take after her smart, funny, and quick. So, not that fat little old lady that I remembered at all. But here's a sadder version of my grandmother after she'd had her first three children, um, or four. It's not clear, the stories go both ways. It's called cholera. My grandmother lay down in her Ukrainian bed, two children at her breast, one child at her back, and one curled dog light at her feet, all touched by fire and the calculus of pain. They lay in their sweat like herrings in brine. E. Katerinoslav, E. Katerinoslav, who mourns the children, who calculates their loss, the village so halved it was beyond weeping. She lay down with four, arose with one. How could she get up, now knowing God's casual mathematics, the subtraction that so divided her uncountable heart? Now I know that most of that is true. Um, there was that first family and only one lived. Um, and he was the oldest boy. So all of my cousins um, who came from me, he, he had a number of children. And then the next three came after my My grandmother went crazy for two years, thought God had forsaken her. And then rose up one day and knew that she was pregnant with twins. And God had forgiven her. And those three the oldest boy and the twins, and then the girl who came right after the twins, made so many children that my cousins are old enough to be my parents because my father was the second to last and his older brother was 20 years older than he. This is, this is about that round frame, that picture. And it's called round frame. My father's past lies hidden in a round frame. The child there has plump cheeks, uncolored eyes, a heavy Russian hat perches awkwardly on his baby curls. He stares out at me, through me, daring me to take away his manufactured birth in Connecticut. All those years, Ekaterinoslav was lost to me when I could have celebrated Ukrainian winters, learned words of love, fashion, passion, paternity, how to season the fish with pepper, not sugar, how to cut the farfel from flat cheeks of dough. All I had was New Haven. Would I go there now when Ekaterinoslav no longer exists, go and see what Cossacks, Hitler, Chernobyl could not conquer, the little shtetl my father alone destroyed by never speaking its name? No. I shall stay here at home instead, gazing back at the boy who stares at me, whisper to him, through him, dare him, tell me the story of Ekaterinoslav, till one day the picture itself speaks. I feel by writing this book that in fact that picture did finally speak to me. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, to when they come to Ellis Island. 
It's called Ellis Island Mathematics. The old world scrambles for purchase in the new, holding on with broken fingernails. The cuticles of travel are raw, bloody, chewed down, but still we are safer here, or so we believe. Here in the squalling ranks of immigrants, the family is cattle, fearing the knacker's knife. More feared, though, are the knives of the horsemen of the steppes, the unknown safer than the known. The family tries on new names as easily as the lady of means tries a hat on at the milliners. Lev becomes Louis, Lou, Rachel, Rose, Aaron, Harry, my father, Wolf, tamed into Will. Is it Yolin, Jolin, Yole? Manifest transliterations change vowels, consonants, till we all sound American. Till we are all sound Americans, only Jewish by extraction, attraction, subtraction. Ellis Island, Mathematics. We found, uh, one of my cousins found the Declaration of Int Intention that my grandfather, Sampson, uh, signed. And uh, it was a pretty amazing document. Everybody had to sign this document when they came, came in, but I had never seen one. This is called Declaration of Intention. I never met Grandpa Sampson, gone before my birth, nor knew any of his dreams, but his intentions are clear, spelled out in a paper, government issue no less for a man who never took issue with any known government. It is my bona fide attention, the printed document declares, though only he filled in the spaces, renouncing all allegiances, fidelities, whether he understood those words or not, a scant four years after arriving in America. Furthermore, he swore he was neither an anarchist nor polygamist, and might have added, any oldest you momsers want, just to remain in the land of the free, or at least in a land free of Cossacks. I don't know if any of you read the, um, uh, the New York Times story the other day in which the Russian government has invited the Cossacks to come back and become enforcers. Yes. Hmm, I don't think I'm going to be visiting Russia anytime soon. My grandmother, for all that she became Americanized, never quite trusted being here. And one of the sweetest and kind of tenderest stories I was told by one of my cousins was she always kept a fully packed suitcase by the door in case she needed to go home, meaning back to Ekaterinoslav. So this is called straw bag. It sits on the floor of her bedroom, a yellow straw bag bound by leather bands, brass lock turned key in her bedside table, all packed for her trip home to the Ukraine. She is not yet sure she can make a life here in the brangling American city loud with many, many tongues, not here without a cow, without chickens, without neighbors she has known for half her life. The bag is ready, bulging with clothes. If she has to, she will sail away without looking back, though in all the years she has never gone until it is finally too late to go. The last of the poems that I want to read um, is back about my father again, Will. He told us always his name is Will. Not William, not Bill, not Billy, Will. But when I found, uh, he lived with me the last, our family the last four years of his life, uh, ill with Parkinson's. And when he died, I opened his bank box and there, was his naturalization paper. That he was naturalized six months after I was born. Um, and his name on the paper is William, and he signed it, William. So another lie. The past will not lie buried. Little bones and teeth harrowed from grave soil tell different tales. My father's bank box told me in a paper signed by his own hand the name quite clearly, William. All the years, he denied it, 
that name, that place of birth, that compound near Kiev, and eyes so eager for the variance with which he lived his life. In the middle of my listening, death, that old interrupter, with the unkindness of all coroners, revealed his third name to me. Not William, not Will, but Wolf. Wolf. And so I at last know that story, my old wolf white against the Russian snows, the cracking of his bones, the stretching sinews, the coarse hair growing boldly on the belly below the eye. Why, grandfather, my children cry, what great teeth you have before he devours them as he devoured me, all of me, bones and blood, all of my life. Thank you very much. I find myself being drawn to narrative, and uh, so even I, I realize that you know to get back to what you were saying, Susan, across the genres, even as the so-called historian, which I, again I really can't make that claim, um, I, although I'm happy to accept your conferral of it on me. Um, even as a, as a historian, I too want to tell stories. I, I mean, I think that's that's one thing. I don't well, you know. The, the word history has story at the end of it, and I think that's very important. That I think the best historians tell stories. Um, and a lot of children's books, in it, for example, um, I just, I don't know if the letter be published, but I just wrote a book called um, Abigail and John Move In. And it's about the, the Adamses, who first were the first people to live in the White House for all of five months. And she hung the laundry in the what is now the East Room. Because it wasn't finished yet. It was still finished. And the other untold story really about that that, that is is that most of it was slave labor that built the White House. So, um, you know, the, and so hearing the stories that you were telling were fascinating to me because they were all stories I didn't know. I mean I got made it know. That sort of thing, but that they had that connection with you, I thought was yeah. fascinating. And I did not know all of the things that you were reading and, and, and your stories. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I like to answer your question. I, I enjoy um, having different genres to read. I mean, I read across genre. You know, I mean, and you I, wonder. Always, yeah. yeah. And uh, I always thought it was odd. Um, at writing schools where you have to declare if you're a poet or a novelist or an essayist or a nonfiction and you're not allowed to take classes from, you know, I, I've lectured at some of, the, some of the writing schools and, you know, they're very, you know, the poets are allowed to come here and then, you know, and that always just strikes me as, as strange because, um, you know, Michael said it's, uh, it's all, story is, is really how we uh, create our history. Yeah. And uh, how we understand yeah. it, too, yeah. So. But it's also how we play. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I go to science fiction conventions because I write a lot of science fiction and fantasy. And I remember early on, I would say, when I was on a panel, I would say, how many of you read 100% fantasy and science fiction? About half the audience was there. I said, well, how many of you read, 50% of your reading is sci uh, fantasy and science fiction? Um, and I said, I read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, but I read history, I read psychology, I read biography, I read um, um, natural science. And if you want to understand my books, you need to read a lot of that too. If I'm going to do a battle scene in a book, I'm reading 
books about armed forces going across vast, you know, areas of, of land. Um, and I think all writers do that. Uh, well, no, maybe not the lady who wrote the Quintly Vampires. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, that's, that's, if we read broadly in myth, in history, in, in, in nonfiction, et cetera, then there's a certain expectation of our readers that they will be broad enough that they're going to understand a lot of what we put there. Um, so I agree with you. I, I don't understand. Yeah. In every field, it seems to be that way. I mean, one of the things I'm, a lot of you know a lot of people in, in this audience I know and you know at my gallery downtown, um, and you know I don't feel that old, but I'm literally the first gallery in the country that has shown illustration alongside fine art. This was this is considered like, you know, odd. And, and it's odd, it's not hard, you know? Um, and, and so we tend to compartmentalize, it's easier to get our minds around, but uh, I think readings like this are great. Yeah. Audience, questions, responses, Karen? Um, a little bit picking up from what you're talking about now, but also I'm turning over like, like that idea, maybe it's New Englanders and Jews or being people of the book. And I just wonder each one of you, like, when, when did you know you wanted to write books? Or how did you fall in love with books? I, I'm assuming you like books, and Jane, I really hope you do because you have so many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like libraries, and I'm trying to fill them. <laughs> I came from a family of writers and, and storytellers. Um, but I thought I was following in my father's footsteps as a journalist until I discovered that I was making up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at a certain point in journalism, you could win you know, a Pulitzer for doing that. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but, I, but I did not feel comfortable about that. And um, so I, I still write nonfiction. A lot, but I, it, it was the interviewing people who had been in some kind of tragedy that I couldn't do. I, I just, or, or, or to talk to the man on the street, that was, that was terrifying to me. Just go up and say, excuse me, can you tell me how you feel about this? Because the first time I, I did it, this will show you how old I am. Cruise shop had just come into power, mm -hmm. and I was sent out by the Bridgeport Sunday Herald to interview the man on the street. And finally, a priest put his arm around me and said, my dear, this is not the kind of job for you. <laughs> so I called up my cousins and I said, how do you feel about Khrushchev coming to power? And they all said, they had last names different from mine, they all said, uh, just make us sound intelligent. So <laughs> um, well, first I want to just get one thing, a biographical detail out of the way. I need to establish my credentials here, and so I would need to establish, first of all, that I also was brought up in a very secular Jewish household. Um, as secular as you could you get. You don't have to say that just because well, No, no I, I, gotta, I gotta establish this because it's a degree of secularity that is best understood if I tell you that my, my father was a biochemist uh, who had Z, like minus 10 patients for anything that's not of God, spirituality, anything like that. And my mother was born on a kibbutz in Israel, and she didn't know what the Torah was until my son was being, had, had his bar mitzvah. And she's in the synagogue, she's like, what's, what is the Torah? <laughs> so, so that's the second part. And I also am married to a, a woman who was brought up evangelical. Christian, and who, who also climbed, I guess, climbed out of that. Um, so there's that. Uh, but uh, to get back to your question, it, my family was a very sort of booky family. Um, you know, a typical weekend. You know, my father is in one corner of the living room reading the New York Times, and my sister is over here reading something, and I'm sitting over here reading. And my stepmother walks into the room. She's like, you know, you three have been sitting in this room for three hours, and you haven't exchanged words once, you're just sitting there reading. So I kind of absorbed that. Um, as far as writing the kind of stuff that I do write, uh, in my 
20s when I first moved to Western Mass. I sort of dabbled in poetry and fiction writing. I liked it. I was in a writing group. I met my wife in a creative writing group. But I found that uh, the, the parameters imposed by academic writing, uh, actually, I appreciate those parameters. Uh, I felt too free with fiction writing and poetry. Uh, I liked it, but it just I, I, I felt directionless. Uh, and uh, archival research and ethnographic research, I don't know, somehow or other, that the configuration just comes more easily to me. I have a son like that. I have two who write fiction, fiction or nonfiction, but one only writes nonfiction. He doesn't read fiction and he doesn't, doesn't write it. He's uncomfortable with it. And, and, and his favorite book in, in, in high school um, was um, uh, which is the the one in Alaska, White Fang? Mm -hmm. Because th there was information. Yeah. Well, call the water. Yeah. Call the water. Because there was information in the book. That's what he. That's what he liked. Um, so I think I think that, that I, I understand both sides of, of that equation. Um, but I I thought I was going to be a journalist for my pocketbook and a poet for my heart. Because clearly it's a poet, you're not going to make them with it. Um, and I was as surprised as anyone when I got my first book contract. And it was for nonfiction. Well, I, didn't, um, I didn't read or write as a child. Um, and you know, I write a lot of kids' books now, so I go to a lot of schools. And um, of course, one thing that the teachers always want is for me to tell their students um, how important reading is all the time. Uh, and, you know, I mean, frankly, you know, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I know a lot of people who read and write and they're sons of bitches, and I know a lot of people who couldn't care less about books and they're nice people. You know, <laughs> Do what you do. Um, you know, I was not. I was not introduced to you know literature early. Uh, I felt didn't really fall in love with it until you know I was already in my twenties. Um, you know, I didn't. For me, I like to go to schools because I like to. Uh, I like to give kids options and say this is out there. Uh, but you know, when I talk to fourth graders and. You know, I see the kids who aren't paying attention and they're screwing around in the back of the room. That was me. So, you know, you never know in life where you're going to end up or what's going to interest you or the path you're going to take. And, um, you know, and, and I think I think writing and reading is important, but so is a lot of stuff. <laughs> Other questions? Responses? I'll give it another minute. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much to the panel. Don't forget that they have books for sale at the table.